Tyrus. Hey, what's up, y'all? Pete and Adamo here. Coming, up? coming to you from Manchester, New Hampshire. Um, title of this talk is uh, Brainstorm with Coplock, Your Feedback, Ideas, and involve, Involvement Wanted. So it's a pretty open uh, discussion. Essentially, we just wanted to uh, collaborate with you, see what kind of feedback you had, see what kind of ideas you had on how we can help take Coplock to the next level, see if maybe you have some skills yourself that you want to contribute, get involved, collaborate. Um, and uh, you know so we can grow together so I will uh, bring up our chat window here and um, if anybody wants to start out anybody has any questions out of the gate we can start with that otherwise we can just I guess talk about what's talk about some of our ideas and we can go from there yeah, absolutely I'd just like to also mention that you know Coplock does have a decentralized uh, nature so you know we can brainstorm ideas as a, as a group and that you know it's not necessarily I hope to hear things that aren't just what Pete and I can do, but, you know, what I'd like to see as many other folks get involved as possible because we're just two dudes and, you know, you only have X amount of time and resources, so you don't want to uh, strain yourself out. Yep. So uh, maybe we should start. Do you want to maybe give an overview of Coplock for those that aren't uh, super in the know? Sure, yeah. Coplock is a, like I just was talking about, a decentralized organization. Uh, it's basically a network. All too often when you're trying to get accountability with police officers, uh, it's you versus them. Uh, unfortunately, you know, the us versus them mentality does exist. And uh, Coplock was created in order to have a network of people who we can share ideas, you can share the story, you can share your videos, uh, whatever methods you use to uh, get accountability. And then, you know, if folks want to support you, they can do the call floods, they can write about it, post about it, share about it, uh, and essentially making you... Uh, you know, instead of it's just you versus a police department, it's you and the network versus a police department. And hopefully in the in what we call the court of public opinion, you can win without having to face the wrath of the justice system. So, you know, again, it's uh, it's supposed to be a forum for police accountability and abuse stories and that people can use to network with one another, to share the story with one another, and then to get accountability with one another. Right, yeah, I guess, and I'll just share a quick story I think which really uh, highlights the effectiveness of working together, like Dan was talking about. Uh, you know, like back in uh, May of '09, some of y'all may know, but you know, we got we got arrested uh, unjustly, um, some BS charges down in Miss Mississippi, Jones County, Mississippi, and uh, uh, another colleague that was with us at the time took a picture with his phone, tweeted it out right before he was arrested, and uh, unbeknownst to us, you know, that resulted in like a, a wave of calls and uh, some donations, stuff like that, to help help cover our costs. So it was a way, it really, to me, uh, showed the community that was out there, both folks that we knew already in person and folks we knew online and some people that we had never even met. So uh, this, that sort of model has really um, grown and I think continued to be utilized by other activists elsewhere, um, you know, here in the Shire, elsewhere, all over the world. But uh, it really is cool just to know that, you know, you're not alone when you stand for what's right. Uh, there's a lot of people out there that are tired of being harassed, tired of being victimized by people with badges. We think they have extra rights, so um, that's essentially what this is about. You know, cop lock. We don't we don't hate cops. We uh, it's the institution itself that we seek to change because that uh, law enforcement today in the states at least is provided um, by a one size fits all monopoly from the top down. They say everyone who lives in this arbitrary area we have a right to your money, and if you don't pay us, we're going to throw you in a cage. So it's pretty hypocritical that they claim to serve and protect you, but they first violate your rights by stealing your money to do so. So um, and all the perverse incentives and uh, lack of market signals that go along with that monopoly of force. So uh, that's that's essentially what you know. For for me, it's uh, it's sharing ideas. That's at the end of the day what what we hope to bring about the peaceful evolution. So yeah, absolutely. Again, you know, we have very uh, guided and principled views on what we'd like to see the world today. But you know, the cop walks an open forum. So if we got some questions or suggestions, we'd be happy to field them or talk some brainstorming. I mean, like Pete was touching on there, I think one of the, you know, things I think we do most effectively is uh, being transparent, you know, documenting, you know, every little thing, which I know can take a lot of time, but um, essentially that allows people, like Pete was saying, you know, to 
make a decision. You know, a quick example would be Las Vegas when I was arrested for obstructing a police officer. We, we utilize Quick, QIK.com, an uh, application everyone who has a smartphone should have. And uh, we utilize that uh, feature. And folks, you know, before my trial, before all these court things, and da 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 da, were able to see exactly what happened, participate in the call flood, uh, you know, voluntarily if they so choose, and uh, put a lot of pressure on them to the point where my charges were dropped before I was even kicked out of, or, yeah, actually kicked out of jail. And so, um, you know, that's just a good example to use that other people can get to as well. You know, um, several groups are starting up all across the country uh, called Cop Lock. And uh, it's really encouraging to see, you know, although some of them may not have the exact ideas or go about the, the way things we are, uh, it's definitely a learning process and it's not something that you should be discouraged of. I mean, if you look at some of the earlier videos from Cop Lock, you know, my first one was all drunk and doing whatever. So, I mean, uh, in that aspect, uh, you know, comments, views, posts, and uh, feedback is what has, you know, brought us to where we are today. And so if, if you're at that stage, don't be discouraged because it is a learning curve and it always will be. I mean, every day it's, I learn something new about this, so it is what it is. Yep, definitely. So for those of you just joining us, again, this is uh, about feedback, brainstorming, ideas. So if you have some ideas on, you know, how folks that are active with Cop Block can be more effective, um, you know, please let us know. Uh, there's a chat. There's a chat tab on the right of the uh, viewer window there. Just uh, if you got some questions, you got some input, uh, maybe stuff you've seen in your community that uh, you wonder how it could be um, addressed. Uh, how how um, you know we can learn from each other better. How we could be more strategic, be more effective. Uh, at the end of the day, you know, we try to. Um, use our time the most efficiently we can obviously we don't want to just spin our wheels so we seek to learn from what we've done learn from what others have done um, I guess I'll also monitor uh, cop locks Facebook page in case anybody doesn't want to or isn't able to get on Justin TV's chat here uh, facebook.com slash the cop lock if folks want to submit questions or chat through there as a alternative as well I'll be checking that here as well right so um, I mean what, one of the uh, aspects of this talk, you know, the uh, involvement area that I, uh, just to just to touch on a couple examples, like some of the folks uh, involved, the demo, the demo found a cop block in uh, February of 010, or 010, <laughs> February of 10, but uh, since then, you know, it's grown significantly, it's uh, very, it's highly trafficked, it's an issue that a lot of people, um, it resonates with a lot of people because, you know, average Joe six pack driving down the street if there's a cruiser behind them you know they get nervous and why why would you get nervous uh, if someone who claims to work for you someone who you pay their salary uh, is is around it's because you know they all too often folks with badges are getting away with things so um, you know we at Adamo and myself tend to be activists sort of on the street uh, we're, we're better in our video skills you know every day uh, but there's also there's folks that have skills in other areas. For example, a couple of the folks involved with Cop Lock, uh, the Phoenix area, Drew and, Drew and Nick, you know, they founded a, a podcast. So now these kind of ideas are out through the Police Accountability Project. There's, um, there's other folks uh, that have taken the content from Cop Lock and put it on Roku, which is a, a um, interface, I guess. But, uh, rather than getting cable, essentially you can watch uh, videos from the Internet through your TV that way. So there's a lot of ways that folks have been uh, helping out. A, a buddy, Clayton G, who's helped us with graphics, you know, folks who've made music, you know, all sorts of things. So if, if, if you have a skill in a particular area that you think would mesh well with what's going on here or something entirely new, we would uh, we would love to hear from you. Yeah, absolutely. I'd, uh, maybe while we're waiting for some questions or some folks to get logged in the chat here. Well, Tack of the World just shared a link, so I appreciate it. We'll check that out. Awesome. See yeah. what kind of questions we got. Aha. Uh -huh. Ah. Uh -huh. Smart. Oh, uh, now we got this ad. Yeah, mute it. Oh, the ad won't mute. But anyways. Oh, there it goes. Okay. Um, Wonderful. I don't have it in mind. But um, let's see if we have any questions before I talk about what I... All right, so... What would be the most ideal cop lock success you can think of, Lauren? What would be the most ideal cop lock success you can think of, Lauren? What would be the most ideal? All right, are we good? Yep. Yep. All right, you can watch this one. Okay. All right, what would be the most ideal cop lock success success you can think of? 
I don't know, like the uh, undercover uh, New Hampshire cop that we ousted recently was probably the most uh, successful cop lock I've partaken in thus far. I mean, I appreciate the question. It's uh, kind of subjective, but I think that's pretty good f for us. Um, I don't know. I Do mean, you want to share what, what happened there? Oh, just how uh, we uh, realized that, long story short, there were some trials for some activists. Uh, during those that trial, uh, we were able to uh, identify a few uh, New Hampshire undercover narcotics officers uh, by viewing them in the courtroom testifying. We weren't able to get very good footage of them, but we remember what they look like. We did try, but we, we got some of their faces. Anyways, uh, a couple weeks, maybe even a month or two later, uh, we were at a, another trial for a fellow activist here in New Hampshire, and as is custom after trials, we go out to eat. Uh, after the court hearing, and uh, we did so in, in that parking lot of that restaurant uh, several counties away, I guess, from the uh, first one, we realized that there that there was two cars parked in a, that driveway or in that parking lot, and uh, it looked like they were doing a drug deal, and one of the guys we were with said, isn't that that one undercover officer from Bob's trial? And uh, it was actually Ian Freeman, who's caged right now. Um, and we were like, yeah, and Pete ran over to the car saying it's a cop, and I was running from behind, and the guy sped off, and we actually saved, like, a, I think it was, like, 19 or 20-year-old kid from probably catching a felony in five years in the joint, so. Yeah, it was awesome. It was a pretty epic one. Dude laid down rubber as he peeled out, and, you know, the, the kid, he'd already given the kid the money, and, uh, you know, he would have probably faced a year in a cage for each of the uh, pills that he was supposed to provide, so, um a really good example of, uh, you know, there being no victim, there's no crime, yet uh, this guy, this uh, undercover, you know, um, goes around uh, pretending to be somebody else just to get people to act in a certain way, you know, uh, that other people have written on papers say is illicit. So it's not, again, there's no victim, so not an issue, but it, there is a obviously a uh, a, a tangible a uh, fear, I guess a tangible um, result that could happen from that, just from people who grant such uh, folks authority. You know, the cages are real, but... Definitely real. Yeah. I'm trying to log into that chat. Okay. So I um, tell people we're here. <laughs> yeah, I guess uh, for me, trying to think of the, the best uh, example of how Coplock's been successful, um, I mean... For us, I think just combining just the whole philosophy of uh, being transparent, being open, you have nothing to fear. Uh, I think there's more good people in the world than bad people, you know, generally. So, and incentives have a huge uh, part of that. So, if we can create a structure uh, where reputation is key, where your word is your bond, where people are responsible for their actions, regardless of their place of employment, I think that's key. So, you know, both for us. And uh, some arrests that we've had, you know, just being public, being on the ground, you know, sometimes for up to a few weeks in certain places, Greenfield, Mississippi, uh, Mass, Jones County, Mississippi, for example, now here in Manchester, just trying to have a uh, impact, connect with folks on the ground. You know, we hear a lot of a lot of folks come up and uh, they share their stories about how they, their rights have been violated. So, you know, a lot of people feel um, like they're alone and it's them against this big system. This, and in reality, it's uh, if, if we stand together. So I don't know. I guess it's, to answer that question, I would just say there's a lot of examples. There's a lot of folks that I think have been uh, benefited. You know, just call floods for one, getting people out, getting charges dismissed, stuff like that is is real beneficial. But Absolutely. Absolutely. I have no idea what else to talk about, but I think uh, kind of touching on a little bit of that, uh, you were talking about like financial incentives or whatever, incentives in general. But um, what I like to do or what I think we do best is trying to mix our activism as a business with, you know, still saying principle and stuff. And I think that's something a lot of folks can do as well. You know, Pete had touched on how some folks had helped or the Arizona team had put out door hangers and they had these cards for a while that some had a cop lock on and stuff. So there's definitely ways to like uh, incentivize your or I want to say business or relate business things to your activism where essentially, I mean, our, our activism is our business uh, for lack of a better term, but uh, those ways are good. If you have capital to like uh, get up, you know, t-shirts in your area or flyers, those things will always do well. Um, maybe you can mingle with local businesses to print out a flyer. 
you know, Jimmy's taco stand can be in a little spot on your flyer. I mean, the sales pitch I would make to such an individual is that, hey, regardless of what this flyer actually says, and you are, I mean, unless they're absolutely what we call cop suckers, um, they they shouldn't have a problem with it. If you say, I'm going to print up 5,000 flyers for this town, and 5,000 more people are going to see your flyer, all I need is 100 bucks to print them. I can't see many business people, not t businessmen, not taking that opportunity. Though I could understand that it might take you one or two more people to, you know, businesses to ask before you get that success. I wouldn't let the uh, no's turn you down because I, we're at a point where most people do or appreciate, for lack of a better term, the police and or think they're more of a necessity than they are. Um, but yet it still doesn't underscore the fact that, you know, like with Marv, you know, some people that advertise with us on Marv aren't. Uh, exactly on board with our complete liberty message but how we relate that to them is hey we're going x amount of miles you're going to be x amount of towns you know people are going to see it without knowing what our message really is and that's going to result in clicks for you you could break that down into the less liberty-minded field you know you could like i said jimmy's taco stand in town the car wash whatever uh, and find ways to uh, subsidize if not pay for your your uh, financial expenses that come with uh, starting a cop lock or being involved in cop lock activities. You know, power post is something that we do. So if you would have a website that has cop lock or somewhere that you could post it, banners for people. Again, if you're a local cop lock chapter, uh, you should be able to do that with local businesses. You know, we go all over the place and we have a little bigger network as far as the literary community is concerned. So that allows us the privilege to uh, tap a market that is more centric to what, you know, we're preaching already. But if that's if that's not you or you don't have that ability, then you know it's not the end of the world. You could tweak it in other ways. But I think we have a question coming up here. Or? Yeah, I just wanted to uh, comment, I guess, on what Jim Bluey said a little bit ago about uh, some of the cops commenting that it helps uh, cop lock sort of activities help weed out the bad cops. I mean, that's that's definitely a great point. I'm glad you brought it up, and it's it's something that I try to communicate to uh, police officers when interacting with them. Uh, for me, you know, it's not it's. Again, we don't. Hate, I don't hate cops. I don't. Adamo doesn't hate cops. It's the institution. So, you know, I wouldn't say it's like Adamo and me versus the Manchester PD. It's like these certain individuals who who arrested us, violated our rights, trying to take money from us now. Um, and it's and so personalizing it is very important, both both to community to get across to that particular person who's violating your rights, and so they can see you as a person and not just like as a us versus them. And like, oh, they're not following my orders. I therefore have the authority to do this because I have this outfit on, you know, so I always say, hey, if you didn't have that costume on, would you be doing this kind of thing? And also along the lines of Jim's comment about uh, we not the bad cops, you know, I say, I say to cops that, that I, that seem like real good people to me, you know, like, you know, you seem like a good person, you know, try to personalize that. Yeah, sure. Yeah, thanks. And then, and then you say, well, wouldn't you want, wouldn't you rather work for a company or institution, whatever that, that uh, where you wouldn't have these corrupt or heavy-handed folks, like where you know if you were showing up to a call and uh, your colleague Jim was showing up that you, that he, you know, sometimes now cops show up and they're like, oh, if, if Jim, Officer Jim, whoever's showing up, he may get in a fight with somebody. He tends to be aggressive or he, whatever, like, but you wouldn't have to work with those kind of folks because, like, there wouldn't, me as a, as a business owner providing this service uh, of, of law enforcement, uh, private defense, whatever you want to call it, I wouldn't hire those folks because, you know, I would be uh, responsible. I would, uh, at the end of the day, my pocketbook would be responsible if they violated somebody's rights. So, I try to try to get across to the good cops that, hey, uh, what, what what we're proposing, assist uh, law enforcement provided consensually, voluntarily, uh, would not uh, would exclude these bad cops from being hired in this profession. So it would be a, a much better work environment for yourself. It'd be much safer because. You know, people wouldn't come to identify you as a bad person just because of, of your costume. You know, like they may ascribe some negative characteristic to everybody today who works for a specific department based on the actions of a few. So those guys wouldn't even be hired in the first place. So it, I think um, not just not just coming down on cops and saying, "Hey, you're you're I hate you, or you're bad, or you're a pig, or you're a thug, or something," but trying to get across to them, like, "Hey, man, like." If you do want to, if you do, if you do a good job and you're a good person, uh, you know, and there's a market demand for you, you, someone would hire you. So, we did have another question that is, uh, what do you think causes cops in the U.S. to be so afraid of being filmed? And uh, you know, there's a little conversation going on about it now. Uh, I think this is broad. I don't think this is just the U.S. I think it's everywhere. Uh, 
most cops, like someone mentioned below, uh, do feel that they're just doing their jobs. I mean, that's how they see it. They see it as I'm going to work, I need to get home safe. And uh, my answer to that is with that mindset, excuse me, they are thinking that some of it, just like any other job, you know, there's some parts of our job that we don't like to do that aren't our favorite part of parts of the job. I guarantee yeah. officers you know with bureaucrats <laughs> yeah, or status, yeah. yeah. Um, but I feel some officers also share that. They know that there are some requirements of their job that they don't like that they have to do. And uh, when you film them, then it's not only is it before filming and the technology came along, it was a dirty secret amongst the thin blue line of, hey, I don't really like arresting drug offenders or, you know, these minor whispers. Nowadays, it's not only do you, you know, get to show them, but it's, it's highlighted. And uh, even more so and probably more damning to the system is that the millions of people out there who aren't affected by police but still have an opinion of what they want their dollars spent on get to see these no-knock raids, these killings of dogs, these peaceful drug uh, users put in cages and their dollars being wasted, that that's why they fear the camera all over. Yeah, and, and to, to continue on with the demo's point of, uh, of documenting this and sharing it with others, it's also important because, you know, a lot of people don't, they, you know, they may not, they may get pulled over and get the traffic ticket, things like that, but more and more people are being negatively affected by the growing police state. Um, but for people that don't have uh, interactions that frequently with cops, you know, they may they may think that sure, like law and order or stuff like that may be a little bit um, exaggerated that they're so good and so smooth and so smart. And sure, there's some brutality, there's some bad stuff that happens, but they don't see it as, as widespread as it exists. Again, it goes back to the the, the institution is, itself is based on violence. So for us and for other people to document this and make it transparent, it really shows just how common this is. I mean, the the uh, the the number of videos that are available online today of police brutality or dogs being shot or homes being raided or whatever I mean is is incredible and it's and it's shocking to anybody you know I would hope to most people that would would take any any time to, to look so it, it really helps communicate um, hey it's not just this person or that person that are being negatively affected it's it's touching a lot of people so you know hopefully um, even if you know, hopefully the folks that are being negatively affected and people that see it can work together to uh, hold these other folks accountable. That's right. Yep. Does anybody else have a question? Let's see if I missed one. Well, I'm going to touch on Scott's right now because he says uh, citizens have a responsibility to make the government accountable. Um, I mean, I would uh, respectfully disagree, Scott, because, you know, just based on where you happen to be born, why do you then have a duty to um, watch the actions of other people and make sure they're not violating somebody's rights? I mean, if you were born in, uh, like, the Philippines or Mexico or North Korea, would you also then say that you have a responsibility to keep, to keep that uh, group in check? And that group, again, is, is they're essentially a mafia. They say everyone who lives within this arbitrary political boundary, you owe me money, and if you don't pay... You're going to, I mean, everything they do is backed by a death threat, and they may start out with sending you letters and phone calls, and then dudes show up at your house. Eventually, if you keep ignoring them, guys show up at your house with guns, and if you try to defend yourself, you're caged or you're killed. So um, that's why I advocate for self-government. You should be free to act as long as you're not initiating force. You're responsible for your actions. You know, I think the bottom-up decentralization, spontaneous order, that's what it's about. It's not about granting other people authority just because they claim it. And that's why we have the problems we have today with policing and government in general. So what do you think about the drug war? <laughs> I think that one's a pretty easy <laughs> one. I mean, it's a waste of time, money, valuable resources. It's uh, overcrowding jails. It's taking millions and millions and millions of dollars out of people's pockets uh, who aren't even using drugs. And uh, it's criminalizing a large demographic of people who are using drugs as and it's criminalizing them, making them an unproductive member of society. And I don't mean that for tax purposes. I just mean that in general, that they could be business owners, they could be employees, they could be landscaping people of the such businesses that would be prosperous and booming if there wasn't such a uh, war, like violent war on, the, on, on drugs or choices. So, I mean, total failure. 
time to, uh, I mean, I think people need to understand that we have to stop telling people what they can or cannot put in their body, that that's the real problem, that's the real war. Yeah, and all right, I'll go on to John uh, Dealer Bitto's comment here about uh, laws. He says they're selectively enforced, and that's definitely true. I mean, it's discretionary. It's up to, you know, there's no way one individual, whether it be a guy on the street with a badge or, you know, someone wearing a black dress uh, in, a, in a fancy room, uh, could could ever claim to know everything that's been written down. And, and that's just it. I mean, that's why I try to differentiate between law and legislation. Law is like natural law, whether you choose to look to a god or, nat you know, higher authority or the universe you know, versus uh, legislation, which is arbitrary and man-made. So I would, I would differentiate, I would distinguish, I would say uh, most people know how to act. It's wrong to initiate force, rape, kill, steal. But, uh, you know, and that's maybe how policing and government started out. Hey, let's, let's make sure, let's safeguard folks from these kind of things. But the incentive of government is to grow. Again, there's no check on them. There's no competition. There's no market signals. So they, they hire more officers they pass more legislation, and that's how they think that they're effective, and that's how they tout their effectiveness. Again, to bring it back to the drug war, they, they say, oh, these substances are illicit. That's, that's what they decide, and all of a sudden, you have millions of people locked up. You have millions of people caged, families destroyed, you know, and it's just, uh, it's ridiculous. So um, I would, I think language is important, and I would encourage uh, folks not to uh, just use the language of, of um, you know, the people that <clears throat> seek to control us, essentially. That's what it comes down to. Absolutely, I agree. Uh, one guy said, uh, Oliver Westcott, privatized police and security are increasingly in demand. I'm sure it won't be long before the community. Police companies on their own market, the big challenge to my mind is how do we do this, essentially, without with the state? And I agree with you. Uh, everyone always says that privatization is the uh, best answer. Um, how come there are no examples? Well, there are no examples because the state is violent. You know, uh, back in 2009, Pete and I were with Motorhome Diaries and uh, interviewed Brad Spangler, who essentially said at one point in the video, there will come a time where you have to police the police. And uh, unfortunately, I'm a believer of this. I hope that there could be an evolution of the mind and a 100% peaceful uh, transition to a voluntary society. Sadly, more realistically, I believe that the remaining few won't be, and, you know, I don't know exactly how some will deal with those, but I know if, what I would do if seven, eight, nine men stacked up to my door and wanted to essentially steal my property, I would have to defend it. And uh, hopefully we don't get that way. Hopefully people understand it. Hopefully privatized markets uh, with real terms of measuring themselves against others uh, with uh, risk, profit, you know, margins would... Uh, prevail, but only time will tell, I guess. Yeah, I'll just follow up and add a little bit. Uh, I, I know a lot of y'all are probably uh, already w well familiar and versed in this, but if you're not, um, uh, haven't been exposed to Austrian economics, I would encourage you just Google Austrian economics. It's just a school of economics that essentially says, you know, we don't collectivize and look at, at people based on, you know, uh, we, we look at individuals' actions, praxeology, prax 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 and uh, I think that has a lot um it brings a lot to the table in this discussion, um, but uh, and also to build on it, uh, you know, while we're communicating these ideas, while we're trying to uh, advocate for this peaceful evolution of individuals being responsible for their actions, you know, that's one thing I think we we try to do when we talk to cops. If if we see them arresting a peaceful person, is you know, like what what gives you the right to to handcuff, kidnap, and cage that person? You know, or if, if we see someone with a badge on violating someone's rights and their colleagues are standing by doing nothing or, per, per, you know, helping them maintain the scene, you know, I say, hey, what would you do if, if, if you witnessed me doing that to some random person? You know, you would come over and try to stop me, right? And that's good because, you know, I, I'm, I'm aggressing upon someone's rights. So um, the, the more uh, we internalize these ideas of self-ownership and uh, cease to grant arbitrary authority to people based on their a costume or their place of employment, the less uh, likely such rights usurpations will happen because they, the government and police only get away with as much as they're allowed. And uh, so while that's working, um, yeah, Market for Liberty, Adam just shared, and I, I, that's, a, that's a great book. Um, but yeah, so I'll, I'll just stop with that. I've probably, probably uh, gone far enough, but... 
So does anyone out there have some suggestions for the brainstorm session? I think uh, the idea and the goal would be to, how can cop lock, not just through us, but uh, maybe your own ideas or maybe there's something you needed, like a little assistance that maybe someone in the chat or that we can talk about to the network later uh, to increase people's you know, knowledge uh, of policing issues today. If you've never had a police encounter, how is the best way we reach that person? You know, most folks who are affected don't need the, the 101 on policing. You know, they know firsthand on what the uh, harms and experiences are. So um, anybody out there with a question on brainstorming ideas or how to be more effective uh, would be great. Um. And while we're waiting for some some questions yeah, on that, cop lock cards, the DMV line. Oh yeah, that's a good buy or that's a good idea. I mean, there's always uh, the PDF is online for the cop lock business card, so you can pick it up there and print it yourself, or feel free to go to coplock.org/support and you can buy them off of us at a hundred a time and make maybe a little video. I've always thought doing outreach to the DMV and or directly to inmates would be a good way to hit cop lock people as well. Yeah, and, and also, uh, I think Adamo made this point, you know, last year, and I think it's a, a, a good one that uh, kind of ties all this in. And, he, you know, he said something like, uh, you know, the reason we choose the cop lock is because, you know, it doesn't matter what someone, we're in New Hampshire here, it doesn't matter what someone in Concord or in Washington, D.C. puts on a piece of paper, you know, uh, I didn't sign a contract with them, Adamo didn't sign a contract with them, they have no authority over us, but that those words on paper, uh, the people that are here with badges on, they choose to act uh, uh, aligned with that. They say, I'm just doing my job, take it up with the legislature. But at the end of the day, text on paper doesn't shirk their responsibility. So, you know, that's why um, if we cop lock and we say, no, you are responsible for your actions. You, you don't have any more right to, to do things to us that you would do outside if you didn't have that costume on. So, um, that's if we can stop the uh, the aggressors here. Uh, those are the folks that that uh, violate our rights. So if we can uh, persuade them to cease using aggressive force, then you know it'll be the, less harmful when the politicians keep writing more harmful rules and Medicare, Obamacare, whatever. Yep. You know, they can write them down all they want. I know the argument does go two ways. That if you if you can get the lawmakers to make less intrusive laws. Um, but just for me personally, I just feel that it's more realistic for me to stop the individual actually aggressing on me face to face, you know, that, that once you're humanized with them. I mean, all too often, getting off the subject a little bit is Pete and I think our biggest problem with cop locking at times is that we're, we're always in a different place that you really can't hold people accountable. We've gotten to two examples of this recently with Manchester and previously Greenfield. But I think with folks who are out there and you're stationary and you're going to live in your area a while, and you already maybe know some police by seeing them in the store. It's very effective when you start talking to them about the war on drugs or when you're filming them for arresting a person or raiding a house and you say, I don't approve of this, you know, and I'm putting you on YouTube and many others don't approve of this. And they're kind of publicly shamed um, into, you know, correcting their actions, especially when they all would say, I'm here to protect you and they're paid for by you. And, you know, as the conversation goes over six months, a year, two years, uh, I'd be very interested to see what a, a town would be like with a very dedicated cop blocker in its, it, within, its, within its limits for that length of time because it gets very personal. I mean, even the cops we've interacted with, even John Patty uh, here in Manchester, has, you know, we, we were joking about rumors we've heard about each other and uh, other things. So, I mean, like, I don't really think he's a bad guy. I just think his job made him, you know, do some things that were pretty bad that day, and hopefully we can see what happens. Yeah, incentives are important. So, if we can get rid of this institution that has all these perverse incentives, you know, that's a, a great step forward. Um, Adam's asked a couple times, so just I just want to give him a response about the second realm. Uh, this is actually the first I've heard of it. I go I just Googled it, so I'll, I'll check it out more in depth uh, when we get done with our sessions, and uh, we'll see what happens. But I appreciate the uh, the info. Um, Timothy is asking if we ever contacted uh, shows. We've done a lot of outreach, like mainstream media. We've done like uh, press releases that have been filed by like people who do it as a living. We've then asked folks kind of, kind of like reverse call flood it and uh, blast them out so they get like several of these and maybe even tweaking their own. Uh, I don't want to say we're exactly blacklisted, but it, for some reason it's come with little success. Although recently. Pete was on uh, John Stossel's show that should hopefully air next month. So hopefully that'll be a good spike. Stossel has used some of our segments 
uh, before from Liberty on Tour trips as well as uh, Motorhome Diaries. Freedom Watch, stuff like that. I mean, I don't know. Yeah, it's a good question. And it's definitely like if we can uh, if we can contact and coordinate and then leverage those audiences, just use them as an outlet. Obviously, it's a bigger megaphone, so we would uh, not be opposed to that kind of stuff. We, ch we tend to be pretty bottom up and just, you know, try to do our thing. The um, mainstream, or as Ernie Hancock calls it, the lamestream media, you know, uh, is pretty pretty much uh, just a voice voice chamber, I guess, for the uh, for the government, for the for the uh, cops. You know, there'll be a lot of times there'll be a police department or a specific individual under investigation, and the uh, all the reporters say is, oh, there's an investigation, and that's it. They don't follow up. Whereas, you know, we would we would continue to ask questions and say, you know, why is this happening? What why is this person being paid? You know, what kind of ramifications are going on? And we 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 don't let up. So, you know, we try to do what we can so sometimes that uh doesn't align with the mainstream media for example we were in uh, a couple of years ago when we were rolling through memphis we got on a uh morning talk show we we're supposed to do a few segments uh and uh you know we parked marv uh out right in outside our, yeah. right in their parking lot and uh you know the anchor came in we did uh, the first session and then uh they didn't air the next two segments because i we were too hardcore and it was you know we we're just talking about anarchy or self-government and it was like you know that's kind of what we're up against but um, but, you know, we are becoming the media, Cop Lock and, and Freedom, you know, a lot of Free Keen, a lot of different organizations, Mises, you know, so like just just doing our own stuff and uh, putting the truth out there. Right, and everybody can be the media. Everyone's got a cell phone in their hand and the ability with coplock.org slash submit tab to, uh, you know, send in your stuff on your area and, you know, hopefully get some eyes and ears on it, you know. From the grassroots level. Yep, and there's been a couple people asking about, like, uh, Jim Bav, our buddy, uh, and uh, some other folks have been asking about uh, specific tactics used when interacting with cops. I mean, we can't get into that if uh, feedback and, uh, and ideas don't don't come up here. But uh, we have a from six to seven immediately following this session. We have we're pretty much just staying on here. We're supposed to talk about police interaction. So I guess we could just just be fluid and go with what folks are most interested in rather than put it out. Yeah, we might, it's might kind of well. going like a whole Q and A thus far. So we might as well. But, uh, yeah, to answer your question, I mean, it's tough. I mean, calm, cool, collected, that's what, that's what we try to do. And, you know, uh, at the end of the day, you gotta, you got to think, like, if yes, if, if this person with a badge is violating your rights at the time, I mean, if it's nothing life-threatening at the time, if it's, you know, some whatever, some arrest, harassment, threats, um, if you stay calm, cool, and collected, um, and you document it and you share it, being public is going to protect you, and it's going to uh, – being transparent is really going to show them and their actions for what they are. Uh, so you want to make sure, just like if you're uh, doing, just like if you're on the, walking down the street and there's, you know, someone handing out information that you uh, might have a disagreement with, you can have a conversation with them. And yes, you're talking to them and trying to persuade them, but you're also, if, if other people gather around and listen in, you're also trying to persuade them as well. And, and so you need to speak to that audience. So if you're interacting with a cop, yes, make it personal and uh, talk to them as an individual, but also know that when you record it and if they violate your rights, uh, other people are going to see it and they're going to, um, you know, most likely conclude that uh, it was not you that was in the wrong. And so that, that at the end of the day is, is what we try to do is hold them accountable. And Yeah, again, as I mean, you, this will come in trial and error. I mean, and luckily there's plenty, I think we've, there was like 300 or 200 videos or something on Coplock's YouTube channel, but um, you have those to learn from, you have those to see. And, uh, you, you know, I think my first thing to get over was like, I always was worried about being clubbed by the police and, you know, it's few and far between realistically. I mean, I, I know that per capita or whatever, the police is a problem, but I mean, uh, all too many scenarios, especially when you have a camera, it's, it's probably not something that's going to happen. So, uh, I guess I don't want to say that cause now someone's going to get clubbed. I'm going to feel like a, a bitch, I mean, we so. saw, we saw it happen in New York yesterday. I mean, it was in the uh, Occupy Wall Street march. We saw, you know, cops uh, push people, have a baton and push them and then hit them this way or throw people down or, you know, mace a lot of people, stuff like that. So it does happen, obviously. Um, but and so it is it is a legitimate concern of uh, some very real significant violence like that happening. But, uh, you know. Yeah, trial and error is pretty much all. Yeah. I mean, you'll see what, I mean, there's always going to be haters, there's always going to be people that support it. I mean, sometimes we do the more hardcore stuff or, 
and you know it gets applause from just the people who know us and other times you do something like a hat no matter what it's well you're childish and ridiculous so I guess it's uh, goes either way. So yeah, and, you, and it, we're all individuals, so we all have different lines. What what we're real, willing to stand up for, you know, how far we're willing to go, stuff like that. So um, let's see. Diane says, uh, "Police uh, believe command and control methods is the most effective way to keep order," and and that's that's true. I mean, again, it goes back to the fact that they operate in a vacuum. There's no competition, so. Their only tool is force. Their only tool is violence. You know, I've never, you know, like yesterday, for example, in New York City, when we're walking down the street, I didn't have one person with a badge say, oh, excuse me, sir, would you mind going on the sidewalk or something like that? It was like, get on the sidewalk now or you're going to be arrested, you know, and, and you know, I try to engage, we try to engage uh, folks working for police departments in conversation and they'll just ignore you and, you know, I wouldn't, you know, don't take it personally. I mean, it's just, it's uh, sort of this mentality, I think, that's that's uh, been driven into them through uh, academy training, through, uh, you know, them acting as a cop, and I don't know, you know, just more of the us versus them indoctrination. It's, I mean, today it's not a, it's not a class thing, it's not a race thing, it's a who has a badge and who has, who doesn't have a badge. So we just need to point out that they don't have extra rights. Yeah. The political class versus the non-political class. Right. So. Um, so she says there's competition with corrections. Uh, Diane again. Um, yeah, that's true, but uh, that's essentially crony capitalism. That's uh, that's the state. That's the government. Some people who claim authority over everyone, saying picking winners and losers. So it's not real competition. It's, you know, like people will point to um, Halliburton or Blackwater as being a pr like private military kind of force, but it's not. It's it's the U.S. government, which again operates on theft. It's a criminal gang, um, a, which is, a you know, by nature aggressive and uh, picking the winners and losers. So there, it's not real competition. And again, uh, The Market for Liberty that was plugged earlier is a good book on that. You know, as it, uh, if you Google uh, Bruce Benson uh, or, you know, any number of things, or just hit us up and we'll all be glad to share some resources. But um, other than that, let's see. Tactics, I guess, we could touch on. Um, I mean, we've learned it's important to have uh, two. I mean, I'll go up and talk to a cop by myself, but it's, it's a lot safer having an, at least one other person with you. And what... What we've tended to do, if you if you have the ability, is the person closest has a has a, a smartphone and is live streaming uh, via a quick app. You know, via just like this, Justin TV. You can get a free app on your phone, or Quick.com, or UStream.tv, or Livestream. Get a free app on your phone, and you it could just it'll go live to the internet, and that's really powerful because then it's transparent. And then if you have a buddy with you, you know they can be. Uh, on the periphery, a little bit further back, so it's uh, they can't just snatch both cameras at once. Uh, that you know, if 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 you or your camera get taken, then your buddy can uh, can hightail it and get the footage out, and uh, there's a lot more protection that way. So, um, absolutely, if you're cop I think the first thing you can do that's more important than any camera gear or whatever you have is having a buddy that is willing to go out there and do it with you because it's just a lot safer. You know, and uh, you don't want to be in the jail cell for three days before anybody knows it. So definitely team up and use the buddy system. More more than two is even better. So every time you add someone. Yeah, Jim asked, should you park away from cop locking? That's a good question. I mean, it depends what kind of town you're in. Uh, sometimes we will meet up with folks like here in Manchester, for example. We've gone out and done some patrols. You know, we'll meet up at a, uh, a parking lot, a public lot, or we'll, we'll meet somewhere. Uh, uh, make sure everyone's on the same page, get in, you know, a couple vehicles, and then go to the, the location that we intend to patrol. You know, there'll be some folks on foot, maybe a car, a few cars rolling around, stuff like that. But um, To answer Edwin's question, when he's talking about uh, ignoring certain folks that are out there on a demographic, um, the political system is meant to divide us. So if you, you're talking about talking to Obama supporters about Obama's wars, um, they're all the state's wars. You know, I don't even divvied it up anymore. It's the state and the not state, the free and the control, or the ones who want to control and the free. But um, I'm not saying I would give up on them, 
But, I mean, cops is like an issue that everyone can understand. They're, you know, if you can ask 9 out of 10 people or 10 people how do you feel about the cop you see in your rear view mirror, they'd say nervous right away or uneasy. And uh, that's just the state of affairs that it's in. So if, you know, instead of giving them, hey, Obama's wars, Obama's problems, more what I call slave-on-slave -slave violence, more um, of the same political jargon to divide us, I'd say here's a cop lock card, you know, Start thinking for yourself, uh, ask if you want to pay for this stuff, and yeah, basically able to sleep at night, but uh, that's what I was just going to say. So, uh, Evil Bill and I asked if this cop lock has a mission statement. Yes, if you go to coplock.org slash contributors, or just go to coplock.org and there's a contributors tab, on the top there there's a mission statement. Essentially, it's all about education, sharing ideas, supporting each other, um, and as we've touched on earlier, um, uh, trying to uh, replace the current uh, institution that's based on violence with one that's based on consensual interactions. So, um, you know, let's say it while, uh, well, I guess I'll leave it at that. <laughs> that's it. Um, let's see, this mission statement, I don't know, has anyone else got any questions out there? There's 42 of you online, so someone's got to have a question. We're normally pretty good at talking, but I don't know if we can talk for two hours straight. <laughs> so Chris asks, a friend told him that Wall Street protests are advocating new law enforcement agencies to hassle private industry. Um, I don't know. About I don't that. know. I haven't heard that, but, you know, I guess what I would say is um, we went down there. I was down there Friday and Saturday, and, you know, let's say there was 100 people total. I mean, there's about 250 people there on Friday, I would say. Saturday on the march there was a couple thousand and uh, or, yeah a couple thousand I would guess but uh, certain people there yes they do advocate that government should exist for certain reasons and um, you know yes they may think that uh, their main issue may be with uh, like uh, corporations which you know I would say is, is just due to like rent seeking essentially companies finding it in their incentive to lobby the government and, and uh, get in bed with the government rather than provide something a uh, good or service that's actually in demand that people want to buy. So, you know, they, they keep out competition through entry barriers, regulations, things like that. So uh, to answer your question, yes, there could be some folks down there that would say, hey, we need to create a new agency in the government to combat this issue. But in reality, you know, it's it's almost without exception. I can't think of any, but it's government that creates the problems and then exacerbates the problems. So it's government failure that gets rewarded with more failures. So these issues that these certain individuals may have that they think need to be policed um, could better be addressed uh, through voluntary uh, interactions, I would say, through, through market mechanisms. Uh, two questions. One I wanted to address was uh, the 501c3. The coplock, coplock.org is not a 501c3, nor do I see it being that way, uh, not because of my um, qualms, I guess, with being a 501c3. I don't want to uh, beg permission to the state to be a nonprofit. But uh, any group that would spawn up that wants to do that, I mean, the groups like Pittsburgh, Ohio, uh, California, San Diego, Indiana, etc., cetera, um, Massachusetts, uh, they all have them, and they're free to do what they want with their websites. If they want to incorporate to a 501c3 and they think that'll help, uh, that'd be great. Um, yeah, yeah I'll, uh, and this is this is a line, if, if uh, some of y'all are familiar with the site, voluntarist.com, that's Carl Wadner. He's been putting out a newsletter for a few decades now. He's, he's great, but that's an organization that is not a 501c3, and, and you know, I, I think we take an inspiration from them. You know, his, his uh, statement on his site, in all caps, says, we are not tax exempt. Your gifts to our work are not tax deductible. Our efforts are bound by conscience and goodwill, not government regulation or political privilege. We refuse to be numbered or supervised by any government agency. So that pretty much tells you where we're at. You know, we if, if people like what we're doing, you know, they can help us out, and you know, likewise, we'll try to we'll try to help them where we can. And uh, but I don't think we need permission. I don't want to uh, to go plead to the government for that. Right. Well, and aside from that, Coplock is a decentralized organization. Pete and I don't get to decide if uh, Coplock.org is a 501c3 yet. It's for no one to decide. They're, they're, if they want to come and pin it on somebody while we have donations or whatever, then so be it. But uh, coplock.org is a decentralized organization that is meant to share information and provide a network, kind of like anonymous. We are everyone and we are no one. And, you know, we haven't gotten many submissions from the status perspective of policing, 
but I wouldn't uh, I wouldn't censor them. I would post what what should be posted as long as it's pro police accountability. You know, if you're begging people to get the head their head kicked in, well, we're not going to post that. That's advocating violence and that's uh, furthering a police state. That's not what coplock.org is about. If you want to listen to that, go over to Police One. But moving on. Uh, Edwin asked another good question. Would paying cop lockers somehow help the movement, or do you think it would lead to some poor incentives? I think it would be great. We are paid. I don't think it's compromised our incentives, although I think the only thing it would do is incentivize people to go out and actually film more, um, especially if they needed a couple of bucks or could be paid to a level that would actually be sustaining. Unfortunately, you'll probably, but we find ways to make ourselves uh, funded. It's still not entirely, you know, um, easy you know it's, it's a lot of work and we, we make a lot of other sacrifices and yeah well, you know one of the one of the uh, frequently uh asked questions by folks like uh who aren't the most supportive of what we're doing uh for example like a couple like a week or two ago when i was outside manch pd i was handing out some uh, cop block flyers that we had made that are manchester specific that say hey are you a victim of police manchester pd uh, brutality get in touch with us and has some websites and stuff walking up and down the street handing these out and SUV pulls up, off-duty cop, you know, he's got his uh, thin blue line sticker, his uniform hanging in there, and he's just glaring at me, and I knew he, you know, I knew he was a cop, and, uh, you know, but still, it's just about being a good, trying to be a good person, you know, he's glaring at me, and he's like, he's like, why don't you get a job, you know, and I was like, what does that mean, kind of thing, but like, you know, like, a day what I always joke about, we're, we work morning to night, you know, like most, you know, most every day, so it's, uh, this is, this is what we do, but I do think, Edwin, that there's a, uh, some legitimacy to your question. I think there could be some perverse incentives from that, but uh, one one way, one idea that uh, some folks have had to work around that is to have an interface that would match uh, donors or philanthropists with would-be activists. So, for example, if I'm an activist and I say, "Hey, I want to do this uh, operation, this project. This is these are my needs. This is what I plan to do." As as detailed as a, a, a would-be donor would would need it to be. Uh, and I would ask for X amount of dollars to get this done, you know, to cover resources and even time perhaps. Or uh, conversely, a, a potential donor could say, could have an idea and say, hey, I think it'd be really cool for someone to do this, but I'm just not in a position to do it myself. I have a family or I have these other things going on, whatever, but maybe a, a would-be activist would then be matched up with that. So that is, is uh, an interface that I would like to see created at, at some point somewhere, but... Um, yeah, there's another good question there, which is uh, from Patrick Nolan. Which is more effective, having starting your own conflict organization or moving to where others are? And I think he's leading towards uh, New Hampshire and the Free State Project. But um, if you can't move, I would uh, start your own chapter. I think both have their benefits. Uh, a chapter starting to you is under, for lack of a better term, your control or your discretion, meaning you can focus on issues that have happened in and near your uh, area that maybe the national uh, cop block isn't focusing on or isn't able to. Uh, you could start, you know, having direct effects that are really close to home of police accountability. Like I said, uh, somebody mentioned the Pittsburgh cop blocks guys before, and I think their problem is that they're in a small town. So it's, you know, everyone knows each other, the media knows each other. So that's kind of the balance going over there. It's kind of drama filled right now, but hopefully after a while it will uh, cool off. But if you really want true liberty just outside of policing, then I would say pack up and move to New Hampshire or some at least other buzzing liberty-minded area, Arizona, San Diego, Austin, Texas, um, to where you have folks that can come out and support you. Because, uh, you know, in some places, I remember back home in Wisconsin, it was hard finding one individual to go out and film the police. Uh, in New Hampshire, you can find six on a regular basis. So. Uh, again, I want to go back to Diane. She said, so you're advocating for no government. I would say I'm advocating for self-government. You own yourself. You have the right to act as long as you don't initiate force against somebody. And that's it. So, yeah. Um, yeah, uh -huh. Kickstarter for activism, exactly. Uh, oh, here's... <laughs> there you go, dude. Well, Jim's asking another great question. If people to uh, support the, uh, the cause, what other things you can do? I mean, like right now, we're in the midst of promoting National Chalk to Police Day, October 1st. Uh, you know, we had a post up that was on Coplock a little while back. It's coplock.org slash chalk contest, I believe. And um, that was, hey, folks, we give you a discount on a donation for a T-shirt if you made your profile pic. Uh, sharing the stories, all the blog posts have the uh, share, spread, whatever feature with uh, Google Plus and uh, Twitter and Facebook and whatever. 
Um, making call floods, there's a few going on right now as well. There's a tab there for that. Is always a good way, and uh, sporting some swag is not only a good way to start conversations in your area about something, but also to help us feed our bellies and uh, put some gas in, in Marv and keep us rolling. So Yeah, and just getting literature and, you know, stuff to hand out. You know, outreach is huge. I think at the end of the day, like yeah, I said before, I think most, most people are good folks. You know, they, they don't want to uh, knowingly and pur purposefully harm somebody, um, but their tacit endorsement of this, what I call the status quo, um, does that. It, it pe Peaceful people that have not hurt anybody uh, that are uh, convicted of victimless actions are in, are in cages, sometimes for decades, and, uh, you know, it's ridiculous. So people, um, you know, it's, it's a... Definitely a radical uh, statement, I guess, but, uh, you know, I would encourage folks to think about it and, and try to uh, stop supporting that system as to the greatest extent uh, possible. Um, I want to, I guess I'll touch on this. Uh, a friend asked uh, thoughts on New York, uh, the people mace and throwing cages and stuff like that. Uh, we just put up a post on Coplock. I don't know if you've seen it, but uh, coplock.org slash Occupy Wall Street. Uh, has a few videos up there from uh, Friday and Saturday, and I mean, I guess the thoughts are it's it's it sucks, but it's uh, why we do what we do, and it's why a lot of other folks are doing what they're doing. You know, we're just trying to spread ideas, and and you know, a number of times, not they weren't really shown in those videos, but some of the the live stream uh, videos that we shared uh, via UStream. There's a link on the bottom of the post there for those. You know, had had conversations with some of the new NYPD officers you know, about uh, their actions, and, you know, I always encourage them, hey, when you go home and, and you take off your costume, you know, think about what, you know, what you've done, and da-da-da-da, and, like, you know, sometimes you can see you get through to some uh, some folks, and here in Manchester, when, when the uh, mass arrest happened in, in June, they arrested eight of us, you know, I, I was outside talking to one officer, uh, Thomas Gonzalez, for probably an hour at one point, offered him a DVD, offered to write some resources on the back, and he didn't want to take it, but uh, after I was arrested and I was being processed, he came in, the room where I was being fingerprinted and he said, hey, who are a couple of the authors you think I should check out? You know, so I told him Carl Watner and Larkin Rose. And he's like, Watner and Rose, I'll remember that. So, you know, we get arrested in Greenfield in, uh, in uh, uh, the summer of uh, 2010. And, you know, we're having these conversations with everyone we interact with. And, you know, one of the guys when uh, they were, we were getting done processing, he was shutting me in the, in the cell. He, he, I said, uh, you know, he said, Hey, I'm with you more than more than you know. And I said, if you were with us, you would quit your job. And he said, my family wouldn't understand. And I said, if they loved you and they respected you, they would uh, seek to understand. And if they wouldn't, if they never understood, at least you stood on your principles, you know. And he kind of hung his head and slowly shut the door. So, I mean, having these conversations with folks, they're people just like you and me. So just getting through to them on that level is uh, is powerful. So that's that's again why I don't think you know a civilian review board or any sort of inside like. The, the, them investigating themselves is ever going to bring about the change that we all want to see. So Chris Sexton says, if you were to have a society that didn't have police, that police themselves, which I don't understand already because... Police have, like we have today. Yeah, like, that's what I was saying, that right. we do have. We said if you were to have a society that didn't have the police like today, yeah. there would be a single sheriff, bodyguard that police would violate. Uh, I don't think so. I think that because of accountability in a private sector, uh, you know, if, if I was paying the Manchester Police Department to protect me because I chose not to do it myself, then when they would arrest Pete for chalking a sidewalk or the public in their building after beating up a guy, I would no longer choose to fund them anymore, and that would uh, directly affect them. So we're not advocating that a uh, society that doesn't have monopolized police by the government uh, would be perfect, but we would be able to hold them accountable. Right now, I can't help but... Pete and I are, and the six others are being dragged through a court system that everybody else is paying for, for something that doesn't have any victim, that has no violence, no weapons, no fraud, and no theft. And uh, for what? So, I mean, if that would happen to a protection agency that was private that I could opt out of, then uh, I wouldn't uh, provide it anymore, and they wouldn't be able to provide for their lights, their salaries, their little toy guns, and uh, they'd be out of here. So it's all about having the option. Yeah, and there's there's a ton of resources out there. I, I we could recommend um, if you go to libertyontour.com/resources, you'll find some of them. Libertyontour.com/resources. You just do a keyword search for police, 
or anything like that. Um, Eric and the Law is a, is a good book on this issue. Bruce Benson again. Um, Someone's asking what's up with Ian. Ian is still caged. She's supposed to be out on October 7th. Uh, he had a habeas corpus hearing last week, and that was taken under consideration. So hopefully our friend will be out and about in the freer world soon. You know, um, and then, yeah, just to go back to this, you know, it seems like there's a couple questions on the what, what it may look like kind of scenario. And, um, I mean, it's just it. I, neither of us, no group of experts, or no matter how smart they are, can foresee what uh, society may look like in the absence of, you know, a monopoly of police protection. There's historical examples. There's other examples we can look at. Uh, to have a good idea, I would say, but uh, you know, essentially, it's just it's uh, it's it emerges. It's it's market innovation, and uh, you know, it, you may live out in the sticks and not have any issues. So you may you may say, hey, I just want someone to cruise by once a month, make sure I'm around, make sure things are cool, or you may be transporting large amounts of cash for a casino. So you may want to have a bodyguard at your hip the whole time. So you'll be paying a lot more. Than, than the person living out on the stick. So I, I've seen somebody else refer to uh, what exists today as an oversupply of policing. So if you think about it, you know, supply and demand, again, there's no check, there's no competition on law enforcement today, so they have an oversupply of it. They start with the core things, like to try to stop uh, actions that actually have a victim, and now they grow and they, they make most of their arrests and most of their uh, people are caged for, for non-victim, non-violent offenses. Right, and think of all the uh, regulations on protecting yourself, like gun ownership. Uh, I'd like to see everybody armed in a society, but let's just say that's not going to happen and say 7 out of 10 will. I mean, think of 7 out of 10 people are walking around with a gun. Uh, how many robberies do you think you'd see? How many muggings, you know, carjackings would there be if a criminal, you know, if somebody who wanted to do those things knew it was a very high percent percentage that the individual they were about to uh, infringe on was packing heat, uh, and if, if not that person, the one behind them, the one across the street, the one driving by, uh, I bet you a lot of people would think twice, as opposed to now, all they got to do is, hey, buddy, look for the cops. Do you see any cops? No. Nope. Let's go jack this car. Um, so Patrick asked the question about how, how, what kind of legal bills we run off of. <laughs> yeah, it's a good question. I mean, uh, I'm 31 now. Dan was 29. I hadn't got arrested before started doing this, like, activism sort of full time. You know, I just thought it could uh, have a bigger impact, you know, taking these ideas uh, out, out to the street and just communicating with folks. Uh, so been arrested, I think, I don't know now, five times maybe, and demo like seven or eight, I don't know. No. But, but so the legal bills, I mean, we, we have uh, represented ourselves pro se. A demo uh, got a hung jury in Mississippi. My charge was dropped down there. Uh, we represent ourselves pro se in Greenfield, Mass. Uh, we got started with eight charges. By the time we had the second day of trial a year later, we only faced three charges, and we were found not guilty on all of those. Uh, we're currently representing ourselves pro se in uh, Manchester here. Facing six charges. Yeah, and uh, other charges, I mean, in Keene, they were dismissed. Uh, you know, Denver dismissed. Uh, I mean, so that, that t has tended to be uh, what has happened for us. You know, uh, police uh, don't like it when people question their authority and don't comply immediately, and we just say, you know, what gives you this right? And we try to inquire and they tend to stack charges, you know, just to, uh, because most people take plea deals. And, and, you know, this is another thing to, to, uh, to expose yourself to is, is like never take a plea.org um, because, you know, it's in, it's in the uh, incentive of the state for, to just charge everybody and then like just have everyone take uh, plea deals and they get their money. And, you know, how can, how can this uh, third party, claim to be a victim for something, you know, when there was no uh, violation of rights ever happening. So uh, that's a long way of answering your questions, but we do incur expenses in, in terms of like gas to get places, you know, Marv gets like seven miles a gallon. Um, we have to put food in our bellies. We have uh, cost to print materials and do outreach. We try to do guerrilla marketing. So, you know, there's, there's signs, there's, there's, we just got a 3,200 DVDs in for Manchester, you know, stuff like that. We, uh, we try to be very, uh, what do we call it, independently thrifty. Yeah. So, you know, we eat a lot of brown rice, some noodles, and, uh, you know, that's about it. But uh, someone asked me a question I was going to answer before. Uh, no, it was about, uh, oh, representation. Like, yeah, we do have some friends that are, are legalese. Um, 
he likes to uh, talk with Mark Stevens a lot. There's uh, some f folks with uh, nhclog.org that uh, I work with on some of my more recent stuff. Other than that, like, Ma excuse me, uh, Mississippi and Massachusetts, we're pretty much done on, like, uh, a little bit of those with some motion work and uh, pretty much just trying to use logic, you know, and talk to the jurors. Uh, you'd be amazed how far it goes. It only takes one juror. I'm, I'm really surprised more activists don't take things to, to juries because, really, especially on, like, a victimless crime case, how hard can it be to convince one out of six people you shouldn't go to jail? Or one out of 12 in some cases, too. Right, uh, or at the lowest number, one out of six. So. Yeah, and Blair, uh, behind the scenes, I mean, we have uh, we have uh, some folks who have weighed in and helped us. For example, in Massachusetts, they uh, went into Mar um, Marv uh, without a warrant, stuff like that. And so a guy named Tom Schoenhorst from Indiana, retired law prof, he weighed in. He's a search and seizure expert. He weighed in with some uh, insight, and he also helped us in uh, Mississippi, and, uh, you know, there's folks here and there, uh, legal, they have more legal uh, knowledge that help us navigate the system a little bit. But like Adam was said, at the end of the day, we just try to say what's up. I don't think we need to go to law school for three years to tell the truth. And, you know, it's, it's not us who's in the wrong. So, exactly. Open carry question? <laughs> well, Diane, I, uh, I used to live in Virginia, for uh, Virginia, D.C., for like over four years. And I used to open carry in Virginia. I got stopped one time in Arlington open carrying uh, about a week after I started at open carrying and I was drawn down on uh, they took my gun from me there was like 10 cops there I was detained for an hour I followed up did a FOIA request uh, made try to make a big big of a stink as of it as I could uh, you know supposedly they retrained their officers told the communications folks not even to send out such calls stuff like that but um, as for your question uh, stupid things people do um you know i think and i would say like the the uh the statement in armed societies is polite society like it comes down to, again to self-ownership personal responsibility you have the right to defend your person and property and if you choose to carry a firearm to do that that's your choice if you use it as, in an aggressive way then you should be uh forewarned that you're going to be have to be responsible for your actions i think you know, my mom, for example, is not uh, did didn't grow up around firearms. Uh, kind of kind of takes a mainstream view that guns are evil, I guess. But you know, I brought her to the shooting range a couple times, and one time I said, you know, I looked around, and I said, Mom, have you ever felt safer in your life? You know, a bunch of strangers, all the guns, but you know, it's 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 safe. I mean, people, uh, you know, it's not a toy, and people are uh, responsible. So. I don't know why the fallacy comes with an uh, officer has a gun, they're trained and they're fine because they're wearing a costume. Right. I mean, if you, unless you know the person, which most people don't know the police, I mean, they, they tell you when you're a little kid to go talk to them and trust them, but I wouldn't tell my kids that. But um, anyways, you don't know them. So I'd rather see everybody I don't know having a gun than just one or two people I don't know having a gun because uh, chances are I'm going to be taken advantage of if I'm the one without a gun. So. And Diane, I would just say, I mean, if your default is to be scared of someone with a gun, then the folks that are advocating for gun control, what I call victim disarmament, again, language is important. It's not gun control. It's victim disarmament. It says you have no right to, to protect yourself, which creates ready-made victims, because the bad guys don't care about what is put on a piece of paper. So, Well, I would ask Diane, Diane, do you think most people who would go out and purchase a gun – would, uh, I mean, out of 10, how many do you think would take a training course on how to use the firearm before buying it? I mean, I, I think several people would. And so, you know, not to mention, I mean, we've been in cases where friends have pulled out guns maybe inappropriately at, at certain areas and you correct them and they, I, I guarantee they didn't do it again. And so it's, you know, it's a process, but, you know, we can't be, keep, well, I don't know how many do, but. I'm saying that I feel that the majority would. I think out of at least six out of ten would take a class on how to operate and learn to use their firearm, and uh, you know would know times that when it should be used and when it shouldn't be. Most all gun owners, pretty much that I've known, take that responsibility very, very seriously. So, well, I, I know you might not think so, but if you're using your analogy about driving cars, then we should just like illegal, yeah, make, and, make illegal driving cars. And, and one thing, Diane, I would point out that's important. It's an important concept. Is it's Frederick Bosti, a French economist uh, from like 19th century. He had a great essay uh, which essentially touched on the seen and the unseen. So today, uh, with all the perverse incentives of government, 
uh, that's the scene. What we're talking about is the unseen, where people are responsible for their actions 100%. They're not shirking responsibility. You know, today the scene is if you have a uniform on and a, and a badge, you can get away with stuff that a Damo and I can't. People won't question you. People won't say, hey, that's wrong, uh, when they should. Uh, the, the unseen would be living in a society where no one has extra rights, where you're responsible for your actions, and where if you violate somebody's rights, you're going to be held accountable. And it's going to be a society, for example, where the scene today is you, see, you hear a car alarm going off, you don't pay attention, you hear someone call for help or someone, someone yelling, you may not even respond, you may not call the cops, you may witness something violent and not do anything, whereas in the unseen, a society where, you know, there's more interconnectivity between individuals uh, because the state and the police don't say we're going to take care of everyone. Uh, it means people look out for their neighbors. It means that if I see something going down, I'm going to, I have an incentive to help that person because I know if I was in that situation, I would want them to help me. And right. so. And with the case with your parents, uh, yes, your parents are responsible for protecting themselves. Uh, if they're elderly, I would assume that through the earlier years of their lives, they may have set aside some money to cover for protection for themselves in the later years. We have a really cool daughter or son who uh, assume that responsibility when they're older, realizing that their parents did that for them when they were younger. So, no, regardless of their condition. All right. Um, yeah, and Patrick, that's a good point. I was just thinking about that. The uh, courts of rule police have no duty to protect you. What, like an example, a well-known example for, uh, you know, there's a lady who had a restraining order against uh, an abusive husband and uh, multiple restraining orders, uh, he said, hey, I'm coming over there, I'm going to do all this, you know, kill you or whatever. She calls the cops, hey, dude, call me, he's coming over, he's threatened me, you know, called again, called again. They didn't guy, show guy shows up, kills her, and they show it up late, an hour later, half hour later. And her family tried to sue, and the cop, the courts rule, oh, police have no duty to protect the individual, they're here to protect the community. So this is the issue again, you know, it's, it's, they, uh, they steal your money and they claim to protect you, but at the end of the day, I mean, it's a violent institution and they have no d duty to protect you. And if you're, if your parents with Alzheimer's were living next to me and I saw something going down, I'd try to come to their aid. I mean, there's a lot of good people in this world, so. And how to make the system better? Again, it's based on violence. How do you make a, a system that is based on violence that operates on theft any better you can't you can't you can't say hey uh the government's too big let's make it smaller it's not it's like saying hey i think abusing women is wrong except you can do it one day a week or something if it's wrong if it's immoral it's wrong so let's just let's just cease to allow it to exist <laughs> matt <laughs> Yeah, I'd like to use the analogy of, like, computers. You know, back in the day when computers first started, they took up a whole room. And uh, they made them better by making them smaller. So, you know, policing could probably take a, a tip from that. If you want to make policing better, make it smaller. We're responsible for our own actions, whether you use force or are peaceful or whatever that means. You are responsible for your actions 100% entirely. And uh, if... if if we're if, under the conditions we have today, we're not even allowed to uphold that responsibility. I'm a convicted felon who can't even have a gun. So if I get robbed and mugged in the street and shot, who do I blame? You know, the government because they didn't come and protect me or myself because I wasn't, you know, gutsy enough to carry a gun, even though the man would throw me in a cage for a year. I don't know. But. Yep. Um, feedback. Ideas, tactics. Well, I think we're into the Q and A. I know. I'm just. Oh. <laughs> it's all. It's all flowing. And I guess, yeah, oh, Diane yeah. and Evil Bill. I mean, if you guys want to have a minimal state or a, the same state that exists today, that's fine. That's your prerogative. But, but, is are you going to let us opt out? If if I don't want to pay to support that, if I just want to do my thing, are you still going to say? Hey guys, here's some money. Go over there and force them to do this, or put them in a cage because they're they're not abiding by what we say. I mean, that's essentially it. Like, people should be free to associate with who they want, uh, under what conditions and, and contracts they right. enter into voluntarily. If, if you, if Bill and Diane want to uh, have whatever policing, are you guys willing to send the men with guns that you hire to my house to make me pay for what you want? You know, that doesn't sound like it's being very peaceful either. 
You know, if we disagree on something, then we should each be able to, you, Diane might like Starbucks and I like Mocha Joe's. Neither one of us is going to force each other to go to the other store, so why should we force each other to go to the same protection agency? Uh, I respect your desire not to carry guns, and if you want to do that, so be it, but uh, I don't want to be forced into, you know, your beliefs, and I don't want to force you into mine. I feel that everyone should be able to free to choose, ultimately and all the time, uh, with their dollar, their mind, and their, their uh, feet, so. Right. It, I mean, it comes down to a plurality of choices and an individual solutions, so, um, you know, would you want the government to provide uh, everyone with food rations? Hey, would you want the government, I mean, food is, it, I would say, is more important than law enforcement. You, you can't go too long without food. Most people don't need law enforcement daily. Um, it, it's an example, 100 people go into a supermarket, this is a John Stossel example, 100 people go into a supermarket, they come out with 100 different baskets of goods because everyone has different preferences, subjective values. Um, so, again, people are going to have different uh, needs or desires for the amount of protection they want. Some may say, hey, I'm, I, like someone just pointed out, I'm, I'm in decent shape. I open carry. Uh, I feel pretty competent in my area. It's pretty safe. I don't need to even pay anybody to uh, protect me, you know, so maybe, uh, you know. So, I mean, I should have that choice. I shouldn't be forced at the barrel of a gun to support a system I don't agree with. Yep. All right, we... I think, Diane, if you want to email me uh, yeah. a demo at coplock.org or uh, something, or coplock.org contact page, we can carry this on further. Yeah. Uh, we got about 40 minutes left, so we're going to move on to a couple other questions. Like, uh, a common question that comes after policing is the government court system, and how do you have res uh, solutions resolved without using the violent state? Um, my question is, how do we do this all the time? I mean, there's plenty of disputes people have, even Pete and I. Sometimes have to hash some things out, and we do it by talking and uh, mediating the problems and deciding what's best. You take your time. I mean, this could also be incentivized through the business. If Pete wanted, who's very good at listening to both sides, taking a, in all thoughts and making a reasonable solution, uh, he could do that for a fee. And uh, courts and judges and lawyers would still exist to go to these things. And uh, you can show up and tell your story, and there could be a mediation. But... I guess we're getting into when, when, the t when another person doesn't show up to mediation, well, at times that could be a knock against their rating. I mean, if we can learn anything from the Internet, like eBay, uh, folks can have ratings. You can be monitored. Even if you switch your names 500 times, uh, there's still another way to locate you, you know, find you, and keep track of these things for the better of, like, not, not what the government solution is to, like, track you and find you, but just to monitor and, like, let other people know, like, a buyer aware scenario. Um, all right, so I did want to touch on uh, Joseph o o O'Donnell uh, mentioned a couple times secession and nullification. I think, uh, yes, in general, those are good steps. I would say that uh, secession from, let's say, from uh, the federal level to the, to the state level is good because it allows for this laboratory of the states. Um, but at the same time, you still have someone who claims authority over you, uh, so why not to see down to the individual level. I would say advocate for the ideal um, because then we'll get there more quickly. Um, let's see. Yeah, Diane, I know you keep keep uh, posting stuff. Just one last comment on it. I mean, I appreciate the insight and I love that there's a diversity of ideas, but we're getting a little off topic um, talking about some of these things. So. I am very receptive to having communication on this, so if you do want to contact me uh, on facebook.com slash or, you know, whatever medium is your preference, I'd be happy to have a conversation with you, um, and we can exchange resources and, and continue this, but... Uh, yeah, we just definitely got to give everyone else a chance. We spent a good amount of time on your topic, and I believe that's fair enough. Right. And uh, we'd like to move on. Right. So, a uh, friend asked, what's your definition of voluntarists? And, I mean, I would... I mean, you can go to Wiki, you can go to other places and look it up. I would essentially say, you know, it's um, it's like you have anarchists who anarchy just means without, you know, no masters. Um, and you have some anarchists that have a hyphen, anar anarcho-capitalist. They express their preference for a, prop a system based on property rights. Whereas, you know, capitalism today, I think, is kind of bastardized by some people who claim to be capitalists. But uh, that anarcho-capitalists, they tend to uh, rely on um, 
you know, efficiency reasons. They tend to say, oh, that the market is the most, uh, these, these make sense because it maximizes uh, prosperity, uh, whereas voluntarists, um, by definition, point to morality, deontological reasons for their basis. And that's what I am, personally am guided by, though. I do think, uh, you know, voluntary interactions maximize ec the economic uh, prosperity uh, for society as well. But I, at the end of the day, I choose to think that we as individuals have inherent rights, no matter where we're born. They're not granted by a government. They're not granted by a piece of paper. Uh, it's just to what extent the government over you tries to usurp those rights. Right today, the government of North Korea usurps a hell of a lot of rights from people. Uh, whereas, you know, I would look at the nation states like the U.S. or uh, some of the more like less uh, uh, of the closed uh, societies such as North Korea. Uh, I would still say, obviously, they're, it's an institution based on violence, but um, I would liken them to patients in an ER. You know, uh, they're all sick. They're all, they're all uh, in, they all have fatal conditions. It's just to what level, how sick they are. And if we don't uh, cease to stop granting arbitrary authority to other people based on their place of employment, uh, we just continue down that path. And our rights continue to get usurped. Uh, so that's why, I mean, some people point out, hey, this chopping thing you guys are doing is pretty petty. And yes, it may be. Like, I, I think the other day said, I don't even remember if I've ever chalked, used chalk on a sidewalk. But I think if we don't stand up for our rights at the smallest iteration, then it becomes more difficult tomorrow or next year or in 10 years to do so. Yeah, I mean, Pete like, nailed it, knocked it out of the park there with what a voluntarist is. But um, I just echo the fact that it's a voluntary interactions. I mean, look around at the world, go outside and see and look. And I know there's regulations on a lot of things, but everything may, came here, you know what I mean? There isn't chaos, there isn't everyone guiding everybody what to do. So if we could just cut the chains that are existing, think of how great everything else could be. Voluntary interactions, no one has a right to say I should get 40% of that, or you should be jailed for this, or whatever, when they're not involved directly in the transaction, and that if Pete wants to sell me a bag of marijuana, and I don't know why uh, some other folks want to say that Pete and I should both be criminalized, put in a jail, and charge everyone else who isn't around to do it. So voluntary interactions uh, without the man-made threats and government-made regulations. Yeah, Joseph O'Donnell, he's got another, uh, I think, good question. What do you think of computer surveillance everywhere looking for violence as a private business? Yay or nay is morally acceptable. Um, I would say... You know, it comes down to property rights. If if um, if I own a piece of property and I contract with a private defense agency or an insurance company that uh, is to look after my rights and safeguard things uh, on that level, um, maybe part of the contract entails that they install one camera or multiple cameras on my property, inside, outside, whatever, uh, to help facilitate that. And that, again, it comes down to what individuals uh, are willing to do uh, for themselves, you know, what, what they would allow for. Right. I think this is like a side product of the current policing system is that uh, surveillance systems are way more pricey than they would be. The average uh, Joe can't afford one because uh, there is no demand for it. If you got rid of policing, I think a lot of people would choose to monitor their business through surveillance on eight hour loops, 12 hour loops, live stream to a web, especially uh, businesses who would want to, you know, if you could see traffic, Oh, well, there's a lot of people down at the bar. I better go down there. And not only are they highlighting and promoting sales and drinks and food specials, but they also see when the bar is full and your friends are down there. And if anyone comes in and robs it, well, it's on TV. And it's stored. It's safe. And, hey, Pete and Adamo just came in and robbed the, the Lucky Two Tavern bar. Uh, now they're over here at ours. Let's kick them out or let's grab them and take them and hold them accountable. Um, that cost would be really low, not to mention the influx of police officers that would be looking for work. I mean, uh, officers always like to say that their presence is a deterrent. And if that's true, then let's, you know, end the monopoly on policing and make it privatized and all the businesses can hire one cop and every business can have a cop, every property can have a cop, and they all can pay for it themselves and it'll all be hunky-dory. Right. Um, John weighed in on that last question. He said, I don't think anyone could be trusted with power like that, no matter how it's marketed. I would say, I mean, it could be. Let's, For example, uh, let's say I start a company. I say, and a demo hires me. I'm a, I'm a uh, law enforcement, private defense agency, whatever. A demo hires me. And we agree that I'm going to install some cameras on his property to one check on, you know, uh, whatever rights violations could occur could be that I take some of the money that I get from my clients and I, let's say I put 
like 20% of it in another fund. I, I give it to somebody else and I say, hey, if, if, if uh, you know, I'm ever, if, if I ever do these things, you know, you have this money or it's essentially an incentive against me um, violating somebody's rights. You know, there'd be checks that the market creates. There'd be, uh, you know, like uh, organizations that would uh, rank folks. And, you know, I would cease to fund, for example, if I found out that a organization that I was, uh, uh, had contracted with was doing such things as that, I would cease to fund them. And it's difficult for companies to uh, violate people's rights to, you know, even to the other extreme, to continue on with this extreme to like wage a war or something, for example, without, without resources. Right now the state, you know, they have essentially unlimited, they just tax everybody and they can do what they want, they print money, but a, a company, you know, the harms would be much, much smaller and uh, be handled a lot uh, more quickly by the market. Um, Ed, Edwin asked, uh, there's a lot of overlap between uh, uh, alternative media, primal food sites, anarchist sites. How can we uh, uh, essentially uh, build on these ties? And I would just say, as uh, Oliver noted, reach out. I would say uh, language is important. Again, um, find words that maybe don't have negative pejorative uh, reaction or to be repetitive, negative pejorative, but uh, to have negative reactions and just uh, you know have conversations with folks and agree like uh, to say, hey, you're free to do what you want. I mean, because you may, at the end of the day, we're not all going to agree on everything, but if we can agree to let each other be free so long as we're not initiating force, then that's it. I mean, you can go over there and you can do your thing with those folks, and I'll go over here. So we're getting down to the last half hour. Who else has got some questions? I see a few folks in here that I know. Some of them got to have some questions. Um, you know, what was that, that Timothy guy that was in here? He was asking me, I was, he's from Waukesha. I'm from uh, just north of Milwaukee, a little town called Jackson is where I was from. So if he's still in here, much love to Wisconsin. Yep. Okay. Um, sure, go ahead, Diane. What do you got? What do you do after the currency collapse? That's a good question. Start bartering and trading goods and services. Yeah, start building up alternative institutions. And that this is the, another way, you know, it's like agorism. It's how how the current uh, monopoly on force is going to be eroded. Just people ceasing to grant them authority, people cease to fund them, and create counter institutions. Okay, Diane, fire away. What are your questions? We'll answer them if you just type questions. <laughs> Don't be yelling at us anymore. I go. Uh, Joseph, I think uh, we, we, there have been uh, videos posted from the UK and other places around. I mean, Coplock being national has been labeled uh, uh, by the Pittsburgh media as to call this national Coplock, but. Uh, We'd like to correct them and say international or world, but uh, it's for anybody and everybody. So, you know, if somebody wants to start a chapter out there and, you know, do what they can, all the better. Um, friend asks, what about being charged with resisting and no other charges? I mean, it's a common tactic, resisting arrest, disorderly, interfering with government administration, you know, catch-all charges uh, that often accompany... Uh, arrests that are claimed to be lawful, which in reality aren't. I mean, a lot of uh, a lot of states have in their books that you can resist a unlawful arrest. But I mean, it almost goes without saying that if you try to uh, resist, actively resist an arrest, you're going to have a lot of charges stacked, and it's it's going to be an uphill battle. Um, and even if you are in the right morally uh, in defending yourself. Uh, at the end of the day, if it's not so, if it's not a deadly force, if you're not in fear of of uh, of, of being killed, you know, uh, think about the strategic uh, fight you want to have and whether you can have a bigger impact uh, down the line if you just again remain calm, cool, and collected, and uh, document the actions of the aggressors. Yeah, let's see what else we got. Yeah, stay away from the cops. That is a tactic, too. 
Uh, Patrick, we had planned on going to Columbia last uh, last year, went on the road with Liberty on tour, but we ended up having to stay in St. Louis a little extra, a little longer because uh, we had an issue with Marv. Well, no, we had a truck pass to uh, Kansas City to get a door uh, locked. That's true. We had to fly by. Yeah. Uh, we got locked into Marv. And yeah. We had to uh, run in and out of it. So. Yeah. <clears throat> Jason, Tal a friend asked, who is Jason Talley and why are you in jail? Jason Talley was uh, the one of the co-creators of Motorhome Diaries and that traveled around. It was him and Pete, and then I joined them. And uh, he now does the CD Evolution, uh, CD Ev Civil Disobedience Evolution Fund. He's their executive director, and he's a uh, creator of Tally TV, and he's in jail for filming public officials inside a courtroom lobby. He should be arraigned on Monday, but he's spending the weekend with Ian. <laughs> yep. So. Yep. Um, but yeah, there was a question about uh, what 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 are we gonna do when the dollar collapses in a year? I know we touched on it some, but. I mean, I kind of want to go back to it because Which it, year? <laughs> I know, well, it shades. I mean, if you look historically, uh, there's never been a currency that's uh, backed by nothing that's uh, that can last. Uh, you know, there's no disincentive for the people who print it the, uh, to to constrain it. So it's, uh, you know, you may do a good job saving your money, putting it in the bank, but it, essentially inflation is just a tax on that. So it's like, uh, you know, your money's worth less and less. So... Um, I would say, yeah, like, like has been talked about, uh, goods are goods that are uh, tangible that you're going to need or that you could barter with, um, develop, you can uh, work on your own skill set so you can be more self-reliant. I would, uh, think that is key and also surrounding yourself with people such as we have done here in the Shire. There's a great community, uh, Damo mentioned like Phoenix and, uh, Austin and San Diego, you know, there's, there's good communities in Orlando and, and Philly and elsewhere as well, but, you know, just the sheer number and diversity of uh, skills up here right now in New Hampshire uh, makes it the place where we choose to live when we're not on the road. Yeah, I'd like to go to Dennis's question, which is uh, doing a lot of paperwork and stuff, and earlier I talked about doing parts of the job you don't like, and that is definitely one of them. I don't like mingling around in the court systems or trying to dance through their procedures and policies. I mean, it's just heavily weighed against you. But um, we do it, or I guess I could speak for myself only. Uh, I do it because, you know, folks will comment on YouTube channels, like, or videos and posts and things we do, like, why don't you do this, why don't you do that? So the next time I go out, I try to do some of those things so that you can show them, even if I know the answer and how it won't work. Like, for example, one time a guy said, Next time the police are harassing you, call 911 and get a state trooper to come out there. <laughs> so I called 911, got the state troopers, and you know what they told me? I don't police the police. So, you know, sometimes I do the, the things that I do are to not only show what I already know, but to show others, you know, get an example. I mean, granted, none of us can live fr as free as we want to in this society without being in jail. So it comes down to being educational self-preservation and uh, trying to show a complete process of everything involved so yeah and I'd like to weigh in on that as well Dennis um, and then we have used Mark Stevens yeah I have Mark Stevens provided some text that I use for a motion to dismiss in Massachusetts for gr our Greenfield issue um, and I also just uh, use that same text uh, tweeted a bit here in Manchester in, in Greenfield the uh, the judge he said I'll take this under advisement I'll have a ruling in uh, a month is that right? A yeah, month? Yeah. And it took him three months to come back with a ruling on that motion, which was denied. Denied so, after we showed up and asked him why he didn't rule. <laughs> yeah, and called, can call it all the time. And, you know, but uh, we'll see what happens here in Manch. I mean, essentially, it just says there was no crime, there was no victim, there's no jurisdiction, dismiss. But, um, like Adamo said, uh, documenting this whole process, uh, I think, is educational for everybody else to see uh, just how turgid and. Uh, this whole system is and hopefully causes people to cease uh, thinking that it's as uh, flawless as is claimed. Joan uh, asked a good question. What do you guys need to help with the help with to further the movement or lack thereof or what was it lack thereof? It bounced up. But um, again, I mean, Pete and I are always looking for folks if they want to blog, if they want to participate in call plugs, graphics, designs. I mean, we do uh, we post things out there when we're looking for them all the time, but I mean, I'd really like to see more people just taking an interest. I don't, I, I don't know 
I have a lot of ideas of what Coplock could do, but we physically can't do them all ourselves and maintain the other things we have to do. I mean, I'd like to see a team of, like, call flip support people that are constantly going to call or commit to making a call or some sort of, like, we share this with other, like, they take cop lock content and put it on your local police uh, social networks, websites, emails, just constantly yeah. trying to feed them this stuff. You know, if folks want to do that, um, you know, like a mail to jail type thing where you could start, you know, that's something great to do in your area. If put cop lock flyers or something into the, the jail system. If we could start tapping the prison system, I mean, that's where most of the victims are. You know, that would be a huge base for us to have numbers that are heard more. Um, again, I have ideas, but how to institute them will take teamwork and uh, collaborative efforts. And I, I essentially, and I don't mean this negative, there are a lot of great folks out there in the movement, but it's just going to take more people, more doers, and uh, you know, that's what that's what we're waiting for. Yeah, I would, and I would just echo. I would say, uh, if you do, or you know, if you have, if you support what Coplock the mission is about, then you know, just try to figure out where the intersection is with Coplock's mission and your passion. And if you, you know, if you're an artist. Maybe you create art about it and you help get the word out that way. Or maybe you're a musician and, I mean, music's powerful. Or, you know, maybe you start a chapter in your area. I mean, every time we go out cop lock and I'm like, how different would this look if this was happening in hundreds or thousands of towns and cities around the states of the world right now? I mean, we would not have the issues that we have today. Um, the ultimate goal, friend, for cop lock is, for me, it's for it to not even exist. If we're successful, there'll be no need for cop lock. <laughs> I would agree with that. I mean, maybe cop lock could then morph into uh, monitoring uh, police, private police agencies to give them ratings or something like that. That'd be, I would much rather uh, do that than uh, doing what we're doing today. Uh, it'd probably be a little more profitable as well. But uh, yeah, I would just like to see uh, people take a real concern and the opt out. That's all we need to do. Opt out of the forced policing. You know, if we have the option, then I'm fine with whatever Diane wants and Bill and Pete. As long as I don't have to or be forced into doing it. And Jay, Jay made a good point, uh, Jay up in Missouri, about, uh, you know, just if you have the right arguments in court, it doesn't mean you're going to come out in the right. And that's true. I mean, these, these uh, courts are, you know, they're run by government employees, uh, people who get paid for by, from money stolen from others. You know, they claim to be independent. These checks and balances that are supposed to exist are in reality a fiction because every the whole process – Everybody involved is paid for by the same people, by people that are stolen from. So their incentive is to protect themselves. Um, you know, it shouldn't, you know, we sit in court and there's all these technicalities and hoops and rules. And, and it's just like, listen, like I, everybody who watches this video, you know, pretty much knows that we didn't act in the wrong, that there was no reason, for example, that half a dozen cops tackled this girl and put her in handcuffs put her in a cage, and then are take, trying to take her money. I mean, there's no reason for, for stuff like that. So it's just, um, it's ridiculous that you even have to go through these hoops and stuff. I mean, it's, I, I hate it. I hate going to court. It's, I mean, it's, it's such a bureaucratic process. Think about going to the DMV for a year, you know, and like, I tried to get someone to notarize a form last week. I called ahead. Yep, we can notarize it. I go there. Oh, we're not going to notarize it. Go to City Hall. I go to City Hall. They refuse to notarize it. And when I try to ask them, why do you notarize other documents, but you won't notarize mine? They called the cops and said, hey, we're going to have you arrested. So it's just, it's ridiculous. This whole, and the sooner people stop granting these criminals uh, authority this, or, or thinking this institution actually does something well, I mean, the government doesn't create, it only destroys, uh, then the sooner we can, we can actually have, you know, live in a, a free, prosperous society without that. Right. I'd like to get to Lydia's question. She's been patiently waiting. Um, how to improve accountability? Well, I don't know exactly where you're at, or if maybe you want to rifle off a question that's a little more precise. Uh, first steps that we, we had discussed them a little earlier was to buddy up system, get that going. Uh, cameras is a huge tool. If you have a smartphone, um, that'd be great. Uh, then you can get quick.com or Justin TV or Ustream uh, right to your phone so that you could video police encounters right to the web and not have to worry about stuff being stolen, um, as well as... Um, using Coplock's network. Uh, somebody else asked how to contribute, and this will help answer that question as well. Coplock.org slash support. You can write your stories there. If you email us at the contact or find my email on the uh, chat or in the uh, contributors page, uh, most contributors are very accommodating at helping folks uh, get their videos on YouTube. We might even do some editing for you. 
Uh, we're able to ask, go to coplock or excuse me, facebook.com slash coplock. Uh, posting there, many have had people help them with graphics for their own websites, uh, video editing, tips, tools, advice, et cetera, et cetera. So just utilizing the networks that are available. A great resource is uh, coplock.org slash be active. And uh, we're also looking to expand on some of this uh, in the near future. Yeah, and Lydia says, so just record. I mean, think about it this way. If, if, if uh, you have an interaction with someone with a badge and you end up in court, uh, it's your word versus theirs. And, again, the uh, folks working in the court are paid for by the same folks as that person with a badge. So the incentive is to uh, protect themselves. is a thin blue line. Uh, but if you have a video, I mean, video evidence is objective. So it, it really helps uh, make the difference. So, uh, yes, I would encourage you, if you can, you know, film with your phone. Have a, there's cheap cameras all around. I mean, if they come to your door, don't even answer your door. I mean, they have no, you don't have to answer your door. Yeah, or I, Barry Cooper gave some great advice about answering your door. Don't answer your door, but answer through the window. If you, if you absolutely feel the need to talk to them, which you don't even have to, uh, open the window and talk to them there because there's still a barrier. And they're not, once you open the door, they can stick their foot in and say that you allowed them access. But, um, and like Adam just pointed out, you can't talk to the door. Um, if you are worried about this, though, and expect police to come, or maybe as a good safety precaution, is to put a camera near your door. So you don't have to tell them, hold on and run and go get it, but it's actually in the same area. Sometimes Pete and I do this when we sleep at night. Uh, they have cameras stationed near our sleeping areas, just to clarify that they're separate, <laughs> <laughs> and uh, in case something happens throughout the night, so that they're right there at the side of our beds. Uh, this question, uh, Joseph, did we make a doc? We had thought about making a doc. We just uh, Part of it is the skill necessary to make something that's uh, long enough, uh, you know, 40 minutes to an hour and a half, whatever it would be. Uh, we just haven't cut up something that long. We just want to make sure we'd be able to keep people's interest. We obviously have a ton of content from, uh, you know, the past few years on the road and all the interactions we've had. So uh, we hope if we can get through the Manchester stuff here uh, unscathed, you know, there's potential we may go on another tour under the Cop Lock banner. We'll see what happens. But maybe after that, we'll uh, hopefully connect with some documentary type folks and uh, try to chop some stuff up. But we'll see. And I agree. I would love to do it. Yeah, I'd love to get a documentary going too, but it's time and uh Yeah, it's time. Money. I mean it, it means it means if we're working on a doc we can't work on other stuff, so there's an opportunity cost involved and but we'll see what happens. You know, being holed up with court cases this last four or five months is uh it's stressful, dra draining and uh damning to some of the work that we hope to do uh here in the future and I don't know about Pete, but it's taken a lot out of me, and I don't know. Uh, I'm really, really disappointed in the whole chalking fiasco and that the police are dragging us through this. I mean, we could be doing a tour right now. We could be out there helping embrace some of these other organizations that are coming up as cop lock groups. And, uh, you know, I guess when we travel, I feel there's more eyes on us than when we're stagnant. So it's, it's definitely uh, not conducive to the goal. Yep. Oh. <sighs> But, um, yeah, let's see. Yep, thanks for the uh, support, y'all. I mean, that's honestly what keeps me going. When when we were in, uh, we had Greenfield, uh, we had our trial out there. Um, you know, started with eight charges. Uh, later, a year later, they offered to dismiss them all if we played to misdemeanors and pay 300 bucks and uh, agree not to sue. So that just shows, like, you know, we really didn't do anything wrong. They just want to get a guilty verdict, and but yet we still try to stick to our guns and uh, do what we could. But the uh, the morning of the second day of trial, I got an email from a, a friend from high school that I hadn't talked to for years, and he just said, "Hey, good luck today, Pete. We're, I'm praying for you." You know, and I'm not religious, but like it was really cool to get that and just like hear, you know, and and uh, Helen, I know she's on here, and some other folks that we've been able to connect with through uh, through Cop Block and just like encourage them to stand up for the rights, and it's that's what keeps me going. So. You know, yeah. <laughs> yeah, but um, I'm trying not to. I mean, I don't know. I, I'm just hoping to get through these court cases and then get back to being more productive. I mean, I just it's a waste of everyone's time and resources, and it's it's unfortunate. I mean, even one woman when we were talking the other day was like, "I'm glad they're putting you in jail for this," and it's like. You know, Kate asked a question before about how do you get out to the aggressors. I don't know that. I don't know how. To, I don't know the best way to reach cops. I've tried many, and I, I don't know. But 
I mean, they got years and years of training, and maybe because we're not stationary that we don't get to see the long-term effects of what would work. But um, the same with some of the people who are just fine with caging somebody for smoking a plant. You know, I don't, I don't understand it. I don't get it. And I don't know the best tactic to use to get them. I can only hope to show them the violence that comes with it and that they'll wisen up. But unfortunately, they might have to feel the wrath of a man before they clearly see it the way some of us do. Yep. Yeah, just to show, I mean, to, to continue on with this Manchester stuff, if you're not familiar, it's at coplock.org slash chalk. Yep. And we're having a big uh, National Chalk to Police Day, October 1st. A demo was spearheading, got a bunch of, I think, 16. 16 chapters, yep. 16 events going on nationwide as well on that date. But, uh, you know, the other day we were out there in court on Wednesday. We had a, uh, one of the ch two of the chalking eight had court that day, one in the morning, one in the afternoon. We were there to support them. Uh, both times, the demo was chalking. I was doing some flyer outreach and uh, recording, and, uh, you know, at one point, the dam was uh, chalking on the ground, you know, uh, you know, is this illegal, this is, or this is freedom of speech, or the website, and, uh, you know, a cop walked by, and he had a, he had a shaker bottle, like, for, you know, making a, a weightlifting shake or something, he had water in there, and he had it opened up, and he just, right as he walks by, perfectly just dumps it on the chalk, and he, oh, sorry, you know, as he's walking by, and the demo, without skipping a beat, says, oh, don't worry about it, it happens, or something, but, like, and then, Fifteen minutes later, another cop walks by, clean-cut guy, looks like a family guy, and he and he spits on the chalk, you know. So these are, you know, we I know we're having an impact. Uh, they don't like uh, us being public about some of the actions, and this is uh, how some of some of them have chosen to um, act. But at the same time, we've we've also interacted with other people employed at Manch PD that have told us like, hey, what I what you guys are doing is great, and you know, it's ridiculous. You have these charges and stuff like that. So. Again, it's just trying to talk to people on an individual level, so. Yeah. Uh, Evil Bill asked that you should document the legal side. We have, if you go to coplock.org slash greenfield documents, uh, there's all the documents from there. Coplock.org slash greenfield would highlight uh, everything we've done in front of and behind of the scenes. Um, you know, other than like a play-by-play, -play, do this, that, I don't know how much more we could do, but we'll see. Yep. Um, but yeah, other tactics, I know uh, Jonah asked about other things we could do. I mean, I've, I've tried to look elsewhere and a part of it is, is uh, allotting time to looking at what other folks are doing and trying to learn from them. But, you know, I want to take a page from, uh, like Charlie Beach and maybe do some of like the love police type stuff. You know, when we were on June 4th, when we had the uh, arrest in Manchester, I offered, uh, one of the cops a hug, uh, when he was walking by the guy who initiated all the arrests, John Patty and. You know, he just looked at me and he's like, that's just weird, you know, but uh, sometimes just trying to uh, try different tactics and being diverse, you know, we're going to reach more people. So if anybody has ideas on stuff that we could do that we haven't yet tried or examples other people have done, like, please let us know because, uh, you know, like Adamo started out saying we're just two guys and, uh, you know, fortunate a lot of folks on the ground as well with us. But, yeah, nice, Jay. <laughs> um Somebody asked what we think about the communism at Wall Street. I think we touched on it a little bit earlier. They need a economics 101 lesson. Um, though their heart's in the right place, they're, you know, doers, they're out there. I mean, they've done something the voluntarist anarcho-capital movement can't. They got thousands of people into an area to protest for days on end. I mean, I don't know if, if we've been able to do such a, have such success, so I, I applaud them for that. They're Social networking and uh, media campaigning throughout the standard mainstream is something to uh, look at and try to mimic as well as possible. I mean, that's something else that, you know, we, we cut up a lot of videos and stuff, but sometimes, you know, we have terabytes and terabytes of footage, but we don't have the abilities to, you know, put this all together into like a documentary type or even just a couple cool videos. So maybe if someone out there has some skill sets, that's something that we could definitely use, but... Uh, to further some of these messages about policing, you know, like educational type videos with our footage as examples. Yeah, Lydia asked, uh, do you have a system where you can call out locals or bring cameras when something is happening in real time? Here in New Hampshire and in some cities and in some other towns, uh, I think Kansas City has one and uh, elsewhere, but we do have a couple of systems. We have uh, Pork 411 uh, and there's Keen 411. Uh, there's their calls, one of them is a call system, goes to like a Google voicemail, message is, uh, you know, recorded. And it shot out uh, to people over Twitter, hey, like, there's a new uh, 4 on one check it out, and uh, people can respond accordingly. Um, other ones are text-based, you know, someone sends a text and it gets pushed out that way. Uh, when we went out last time in Manchester, we asked, uh, 
We asked folks on the streets that, were, that we met when we were doing outreach that were real receptive. Uh, hey, if you see anything going down tonight, you think we should show up at to, uh, to document, to record, uh, uh, just like do just tweet uh, like hashtag cop lock or at cop lock. But yeah. we're going to get better at stuff like that. I think it's a, I think it's an area we could expand on. And it could be an area where, you know, folks not even that aware of cop lock could uh, utilize. They could say, you know, whatever uh, city they're in with cop lock or something and folks on the ground could go out. And other folks have talked about developing applications where uh, if, if I start recording with my uh, Ustream, for example, um, it would ping people within, let's say, three miles or five miles, like, hey, so-and-so is recording a police stop in this area. So if, if I happen to be in that, if I happen to get a ping that a demo is doing that, I could just show up immediately. But uh, we also use uh, marine band radios. We uh, communicate uh, with radios when we're out doing patrolling and stuff like that. And, uh, you know, it's, it's effective. Communication is important. So. Absolutely. So we're coming down to the last few minutes here. I don't know if anyone else has a question or two they'd like to slide in here. But uh, thanks, Jay. Yeah, and friend. Yep, everybody. Yeah, did you touch on that? Their marine band radio. Yeah, yeah, that's what Yeah, and we have we have talked to students. I actually used to work in a place that uh, had scholarships and seminars for students, so we uh, had an end that way for, for a while. But uh, Students for Liberty is another good group that holds regional conferences. We've been able to go to and do some uh, outreach. And uh, yeah, you're right. Colleges are real receptive, so we plan on interacting with a couple uh, student groups here in the Manchester area in, in the near future. So you know, we'll do what we can. Yep. And uh, looking forward to seeing you, Clyde, and Chris on the 1st. Uh, anybody in the New Hampshire area, Manchester is going to have a Chalk to Police Day. It also coincides with a very large chili cook-off, worldwide chili thing, so we should have uh, quite the audience for uh, uh, our Chalk to the Police event. Uh, we'll see how that goes. And also the park we've selected is also blocked within the police station if we uh, decide to come near anyone. But real quick, I can lift off, list off some of the areas that are having a – uh, Chalk to Police event. We have Keene, New Hampshire, Manchester, Bellevue, Ohio, Columbus, Ohio, Minneapolis, uh, Minnesota, San Diego, California, San Jose, California, and there's a generic one for all of Cop Lock as well, or excuse me, California, and then uh, Phoenix and Quartzsite, Arizona, Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, Kansas City, Missouri, not Kansas, Kansas City, Missouri, Las Vegas, Nevada at UNLV, Durango, Colorado, and uh, Lake Worth, Florida. Um, times and things vary. Head over to coplock.org slash chalk the police. And uh, if you. And, yeah, I would just want to know too if you uh, if there's not an event in your area and you start one, we're uh, given uh, uh, Never Take a Plea, is, uh, we'll give you a shirt. And uh, we're anybody who's participating in the uh, National Chalk the Police Day, you make your profile pic on Facebook. Uh, that our icon uh, will get you five bucks off uh, a t shirt uh, through coplock.org slash support. Uh, for do for a donation there. Exactly, and in order to get that Never Take a Plea Deal shirt, you just got to get 10 people to uh, confirm they are RSVPing to your event. So some cool ways to get some swag and uh, share what we feel is a good idea. You know, uh, some yeah. folks criticize a little bit about chalk in the building, but, um, yeah, decision was made. Yeah. <laughs> I did it, so yeah. whatever. But, uh, yeah, good to see all the uh, love out there and the support. Uh Hope next time we're on the road we can connect with a lot of y'all. But, but yeah, all right, guys, this is all about ideas. So I'd encourage you, uh, you know, just start having conversations with folks in your sphere, your coworkers, your family. Um, that's about it. Come to the Pacific Northwest. I love the Pacific Northwest, but uh, might be a little cold this time of year. Let's get up there next year. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks a lot, guys. We will uh, check you later. Yep. Any uh, feedback or input, hit us up on coplock.org. There's yeah. a contact button there. Or hit us up uh, on Facebook or wherever else. Or the coplock.org forum. So coplock.org slash forum is a good place to connect with others, city by or state by state. And uh, we're still working on getting that buzz into where it should be, but we should. Uh, Ian, real quickly, I would say no for me and yes for a demo. <laughs> 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 Which one? Yeah, right?
All right, guys. Uh, much love. Take care. Peace. Yeah.